All right. Well, um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, hopefully, everyone um, can hear me, see me, um, and uh, see the uh, slide up right now. Um, so this is um, our, um, our workshop on the future of entrepreneurship centers and the role you can play. Um, we are hosting this as the Centers and Institute um, SIG. Uh, I'm Ben Williams. I am co-chair of the Centers and Institute SIG with Janetta Bozeman Hardy, who is also here. Uh, we're going to hear a lot more from uh, Janetta here in a little bit. Um, and our communications chair is uh, Cecilia Pineda. Um, and what we really want to do today is, is sort of position um, um, the, a larger topic, which is the future of entrepreneurship centers. Um, and um, your own careers in order to, um, to play a role in the future of, of entrepreneurship centers. Um, I am very, very excited to have our guest speaker today. Oh, and I guess I can click through, sorry, there's our agenda. Uh, so I'm very, very excited to have our, uh, our speaker, uh, Dr. K here today. Many of you already know Caracco, um, but, um, but we're going to be, uh, this is going to be a great conversation and hopefully during the meeting, um, during the, uh, USASB conference, Cecilia, can you remind me when, uh, what day and time our, um, our meeting is during the conference? Wednesday, 3 PM. Wednesday at 3 PM. I hope all of you can join us. Um, I will also remind you to join our SIG through, um, through the SASB website. Um, and we also have a LinkedIn group um, that you can join um, that Cecilia hopefully is going to post in the chat um, right now. So uh, please join us on, on LinkedIn um, through the USASB website and hopefully we'll be able to continue this conversation um, um, with, um, with all of you during our, our annual meeting at the USASB conference. All right, with that said, let's get to the main events. Um, uh, as I said, we've uh, Donald F. Caracco or Dr. K to many of you. Um, you'll uh, hopefully many of you already know Dr. K, especially if you've been in, involved in USASB or GCEC. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Caracco is the Jack M. Gill Distinguished Chair of Entrepreneurship. Um, he's a professor of entrepreneurship, executive and academic director for the Johnson Center for Entrepreneurship Innovation and the Institute for Entrepreneurship and Competitive Enterprise at the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University in Bloomington. Uh, he has uh, authored or co-authored over 200 articles um, on different aspects of entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, he has authored uh, 30 books. Um, Dr. K is, is, um, has been around um, and has laid the groundwork up for a lot of the entrepreneurship um, scholarship and, um, and the way that we teach entrepreneurship these days. And we are excited to hear his thoughts um, on the future of entrepreneurship centers. Um, at this point, um, Dr. K, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna turn it on over to you. So thank, thank you. you ben. I appreciate that introduction. Thanks a lot. Uh, so I see a lot of uh, friendly faces and uh, people that I know. Um, welcome everybody. I think you're just being kind to tune into me, <laughs> but I'm glad you did. Uh, so anyway, the uh, for those who don't know, the Dr. K nickname came over 30 years ago by a student that couldn't pronounce my last name. He asked if I, he could uh, call me Dr. K. I said, sure, that's fine. And for those of you that know how students are, it went through the hallways and within weeks, I became Dr. K, trust me. Um, and then it got uh, really uh, validated. Uh, I do a television segment in, in the city of Indianapolis uh, once a month uh, on, on you know, Dr. K's Entrepreneurial Mind. And uh, they created a logo with the Dr. K and the lightning bolt coming out of it. It's really cool, I must admit. Um, but you go on every week uh, with that behind you on TV. And let me just tell you, it, it validates your Dr. K. So, that's kind of the story behind it. Uh, it's it's near and dear to me as a nickname, and I just I just get a kick out of it. So uh, anyway, that's why. But thought I'd kind of explain that to, to folks. Um, first thing I wanted to say today is uh, thank you all uh, for entrusting me with talking about this. Some of you are that are on here are very veteran uh, center directors. You guys have done some some tremendous things at your universities, and 
you know, let me just say, I'm no Yoda and I can't predict the future, okay? <laughs> I think that's always dangerous when we start to, to look ahead too far. Uh, but I will say a couple of things, then I want to open it up to a discussion. And, and really like to hear your inputs, questions, anything. Um, but I think that as I look at everything that's gone on in the past, and I was, by the way, for those that don't know, especially the younger folks, I was president of USASB in 1994. <laughs> How about dating ourselves here, okay? Uh, so I go back a long way with you, Sasby. Um, and so uh, even back to the, the late 80s with them when I became an officer. Uh, another quick story I'll just tell you is the newsletter liaison was created by me. <laughs> That's how I became an officer uh, at USASB because I showed up at an officer's meeting and they said, you can't be here. Only officers are allowed here. And I said, oh, well, I'd like to be an officer. <laughs> They said, well, we don't have any openings. Uh, oh, by the way, do you know how to, would you want to do a newsletter for us? And I said, sure. And they said, well, then we'll make you a newsletter editor and you can stay. <laughs> That's a true story. Uh, anyway, that was the, the birth of the newsletter, but I have a lot of great memories and a lot of great um, uh, fond things that happened with you, SASB, over the years. So it's always been a, an organization near and dear to my heart. And I hope it is and always will be with you as well. But as I look at things from the past and, and as we're facing now, the one thing I think we're all, I, I think we all agree on is that COVID-19 uh, has not only changed things during this past year of 2020, but it will change things going forward. Uh, if anyone is sitting there saying, well, what's gonna happen is the virus will eventually pass, we'll get a vaccine, and then we're all going back to normal. Well, I don't believe that. I don't believe we're gonna go back to the normal that we knew back in 2019. I'm not saying that things won't become a little bit more normal, but I think we're gonna see a lot of changes. And as center directors, I firmly believe that we are gonna end up at our universities in a bit of the center of this. Here's why, I'll give you my explanation. Number one, I think that uh, I'm sure if your university is like ours at Indiana University, and we are a big 10 school, <laughs> um, I know that starting next July, we're gonna face some budget crisis here. Uh, I talked to the vice president of our uh, finance in, in the, the president's office, and he explained to me that starting in August, it costs this university $1 million a week for the testing. Uh, that was after the state cut our budget by about 18 million. So universities are going to, while everyone was sort of staying at home and everything's fine, um, I don't think that's going to be the case uh, in, in the years ahead. We're all going to face some tough situations. So as center directors, um, one of my things I would heed everyone to, to take heed of is we have to be innovative leaders and we have to step forward. And with our centers, we may be doing some different things that we ordinarily did not do, but we will do, uh, or we'll do it better. So I think that's the change that's coming. And I want all of you to understand, if you're not immersed in the center of the academic side of a university, if you're just sort of an outreach center that's just out there and you're not tied into the curriculum, the research, the faculty, uh, you better be careful because when the cuts come, they look for the ancillary things to cut in universities. And so the last thing I would wanna see any of you face is to be simply removed, <laughs> your center's gone. Uh, or you say, well, we have an endowment. They can't just get rid of the center. Well, there's a lot of things they can do with endowments. <laughs> uh, and they can talk to the donor and they can make a lot of adjustments. So, but they will not do that if you're sort of at the heart of it all. So I really feel that the future of centers is to make sure they get a little bit more for those that are not ingrained in the academic side to get ingrained. There are so many ways to do that. You can support your researchers. You can give them research opportunities by you know, getting uh, access to entrepreneurs. If they need to do surveys and stuff like that, there's just a myriad of ways you can do that. So I really, number one, I encourage everyone to think about that going forward. How do we become more immersed in the curriculum and research side, which is what the heart of universities is all about. Second thing is, for many center directors say to me, well, I came from the business world. Well, so did I before I ever became an academic. So I get that. 
But a lot of people from the business world say, well, what I'm going to do is make my center totally self-sufficient. We're going to be a profit center. Um, well, I've been in this game a long time, and I don't believe that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't. Do I believe that you can be self-sufficient? Yes. But you're going to need to do that through grants, donations. If you think you're going to run programs and charge entrepreneurs, which I did many, many moons ago, so I lived through this myself. When the times were good, by the way, <laughs> um, that is a that's a, a very scary way to go, because you'll find yourself um, sort of in the red quite a bit. So I want you to understand that what you're facing now and what we're all facing is going to be entrepreneurs and small firms that are hurting after COVID. We're watching small businesses go out of business. We're watching them hanging on by a thread. I mean, it's really scary what's going on out there right now. While our government sits in Washington and argues with each other, that's just great. <clears throat> but meanwhile, small businesses are suffering, suffering mightily. And so hopefully as we come out of this pandemic, and I'm sure we will at some point, uh, when we do, we're gonna be, have far less small firms. And of those that survive, they are going to be hurting. And for entrepreneurs that are starting out right now, it's gonna be a different environment for them. So the idea of charging them for seminars or things like that, I just think that is gonna be a bad way to go. You're gonna to have to position yourself as a center that can help entrepreneurs, but do it on someone else's dime. Can you get donors? Can you get um, a foundation to support it? Can you, you know, get a grant? That's gonna be the way to go because the next couple of years are gonna to be tough. So those are a couple of things I wanted to point out that I'm looking at. And the other last thing I would say is that you have to remember the old adage that if you're not changing and improving or adjusting, then you're falling behind. And so during this time that we're all quarantined, I guess, in, in some ways, we really should be trying to plan what is the next step? What's the new innovation our center can take? How do we position ourselves now? This is the time to be strategic, not the time to be reactive. So you've got to be strategic in where you're going to reposition or do things differently as we come out of this. If you're aiming for fall of 2021, whatever it may be, but I think this is the time. So those are my thoughts. Uh, again, I'm not Yoda. <laughs> I'm not saying it's, it, this is all going to come to pass exactly like this, but it's the things that keep me up at night and these are the things that scare me. And these are the things I'm thinking about constantly for my center and for my program at Indiana. So those are just some thoughts I have for you guys. And with that, you know, we're, we're getting to the almost 115. And I want to save the at least 15 minutes for questions and discussion, because all of you are brilliant leaders in your own right at your own universities. So I, I'm more than willing to take questions or listen to your, your ideas as well. So please chime in. Ben, I'll turn over to you and let you kind of you know, uh, negotiate this a little bit, but I'd uh, sure. love to hear from folks. Well, thank you. And, and I'll just, uh, I just want to pop in and say, if, um, if you're a little too shy to, to unmute and ask your question, I'll be, I'll be monitoring the chat. If you wanted to place it in there, then I can, I can go ahead and, and read those out. But uh, since, I, since I do have, um, have the, the floor at this point, I'll, uh, I'll ask you, Dr. K, you, know, you mentioned um, you know, the centers need to be tied to the core mission of the university, but I think what I'm seeing with a lot of uh, our centers out there is we're being asked to do more and more ancillary programming. Um, so things like going out and consulting with small businesses, going out and giving workshops to the community. How do you, how do you tie those two things together and, and where, where is the point where we start trying to say, all right, we're doing, we need to pull back and get back to the core mission versus always following you know our, our deans or whoever else is asking us to do them one more favor or or you know one more workshop to, to chase another dollar where, where where do you see that line being drawn well i think part of it is with the budget uh of your centers so for example if the dean is starting to ask you to do more and more ancillary work your question back is to the dean and where exactly does that funding come from <laughs> because i think that's a logical question to ask back if a dean is asking me to do a lot more, then my question is going to be, and so I assume you're going to be providing some funding, right? Journal vouchering, funding into the center for us to, to, to do that. Or 
if I'm going to have to do something extra and bring on an extra person, you know, in the center uh, to help us do some of these new programs, you are funding that. Is that correct? <laughs> now, I know I'm being facetious, you know, with, with my questions like that, but I think that's where you have to start to draw the line because, uh, as we all know, I think the deans would bleed us dry <laughs> if they could uh, and, and not give a nickel. So they have to understand that uh, all these ancillary things you keep asking us to do, there's a cost that goes with that. Uh, and so for them to say something like, well, just go do it and go get a grant. Okay, fine. Uh, tell me which agency you're, you're suggesting. <laughs> um, so I think that's been in all honesty where you have to draw the line as to what staff wise can you handle? And then budget wise, what exactly can you handle? Now, having said that, back to your question about how do we get immersed back into the, the academic core? That to me is not that difficult because there's ways to talk to your faculty that are teaching entrepreneurship and be able to ask them, are the things our center could be doing for you? Are the things we can help you with either in your research or for the classroom? Bring speakers, help you get speakers, help you do things. Because then they start to see the center as a viable resource for them, for their critical mission. So those are some of the, the, the baby steps that can be taken that I think start to move that center into, into the right direction. Thank you. And, and I'll just remind anyone, if, if anyone wants to just unmute and ask your question, feel free. I do have a couple of questions coming in through the, the chat here that I'll start with, but but feel free to, to jump in with your question. So uh, Michael asks, do you see our centers taking on an increasing leadership role in the ecosystem building movement? Yes, I do. Um, I think <coughs> ecosystems, as you know, are comprised of all the players that are going to be surrounding the entrepreneurial movement and stuff. And universities are being pulled into that as to be critical components. And so I think our centers really should, and the way your questions phrase is actually almost a comment, which I agree with, they should be taking a leadership role. They should be recognized as if the university is gonna be involved in this ecosystem, it's our centers that have to be at the forefront of leading that. So absolutely, I, I would agree with that 100%. And this, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do my own questions in here just uh, just because I can but uh, uh, within that um, you know I'm, I'm in Kansas City and one thing we've seen is an explosion of entrepreneurial support organizations over the last 10 15 years and a lot of different organizations sort of jostling for that lead role uh, in in that ecosystem and, and trying to be a leader in there do you see the role of a university as one that can take a lead in that 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 um, that ecosystem, or or should we be one piece and let someone else lead that ecosystem? Yeah, that's a great question, Ben. Uh, I believe that universities should be a piece of it, and not take the lead. Um, I'll tell you why. I think that sometimes what happens is if universities take the lead, the organizations have a tendency to say, "Well, then we'll get the funding from that university as well." And then pretty soon the university gets tied in a little too tightly, you know, with budgets and all kinds of things. And it gets a little bit, it can get a little bit ugly. Uh, and so, and then you begin to say, well, where do we exactly draw the line between what is the university and, and sort of what is the ecosystem? Uh, so I would prefer to see the universities be certainly a, a component and the center is a leader, as we just said, in all honesty, Ben, but not leading the ecosystem. I don't think that's good. Thanks. And I got a oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I, I saw a question from, from Andy um, in the chat room, and it was one of my questions because we, we've seen a dip in terms of student engagement. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, you know, and, and I wanted to know if, uh, if you're seeing that as well, and then what are you doing to do that? That's my first question. And then the second question as a center director, um, we are looking at ways to engage our faculty because we're not on the academic side. And yes, we are uh, slowly but surely in, in, in ingratiating ourselves into that space. Uh, could you speak a little bit more about that as well, how we could be more effective and more efficient? Right, so uh, yeah, both are great questions. First question, uh, yes, we're seeing a drop off in student engagement. Uh, Zoom has a way of doing that. Uh, I think we're all getting, you know, Zoom fatigue, right? Let's be honest. And, and I visit with some students and uh, they got Zoom fatigue too. 
they tell me they just click on their zoom and they never show their face. You know, they've just got their name or, you know, like a lot of us are doing today. Um, and so there, what that causes is it, it causes them to be, become further and further away from whether they really want to be engaged. It's like their attitude is, well, what's the point? And so that's why this pandemic is, is destroying society in a lot of ways. It's pulling us farther and farther apart, which is very scary. Uh, that, that's a bigger issue, I know, but, um, but with our students. So your question was, well, what are we doing? Well, in all honesty, Janetta, right now, nothing. Right now, my attitude is I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna wait right now and see what spring brings. We're still trying to run our, comp, you know, our, our uh, business plan competition online, of course. You know, We're trying to get the students engaged as best we can. We're trying to create some excitement and stuff. So we're, we're going ahead with programming and trying to reach out to the students to, to get them excited. And we work through our professors. I, I think uh, uh, Dr. Sarah Cochran's on the call here today, and uh, she's one of our, our phenomenal professors that I, I try to work through because she has a real way to get to the undergrads and stuff. So we're trying to do that. And, and I know um, Dr. Cochran and some of our other professors have actually been in class with the students because you know we did a hybrid approach. And, and I think that's been pretty powerful uh, for the students. So um, anyway, those are some of the things that we're trying to do. Um, your second point was about the engagement back to the academic side and, and you know, what are some ways? Well, as I mentioned, I think, I think that just to start th saying to them things like, do you need guest speakers that I could help bring into the classroom? Um, would you ever want me to be a guest speaker to talk about some of the things we do with entrepreneurs and where we see their problems? Uh, you know, just those kinds of volunteering things. I know that sounds so simple, but it, it can, can mean a lot to a professor. And then, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, that also ask them, are the things we could maybe help you with to engage you if you need a survey or research done, we could get you to an ecosystem or get you to entrepreneurs where that could be accomplished. Things like that begin to make the academic side uh, take notice and say, yeah. And then what we've done here at our center, of course, we're, we're really a, a very powerful research focused center, but um, I provide funding to our professors and to our doc students, uh, which, you know, then obviously that's, <laughs> they like that. Um, so, you know, things like that. So there, there are some simple steps to take and then slowly but surely, I really believe, Janetta, you get more ingrained and more valued by the academic side. So I hope those, those ideas help because I'm trying to think of things to get it started <clears throat> for people. Yeah, those, those are absolutely excellent. And we have tied into our uh, Office of Research and Academic um, Office of uh, Research and uh, Sponsored Programs. And Excellent. so we're working very closely with them. We're getting ready to introduce a tech transfer initiative. So we're helping on that research end. We got an i -Corps grant. So, oh, um, so yeah, we're, 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 I'm going to definitely take up, take you more up on that advice. Yeah, so thank you so much. You're doing the right things. That's fantastic. That really is. We had a, a question come through in a, in a private chat here that is, that is related. And I'm not sure that they're, that, that there is an answer to this just yet, uh, at, at least at this point, uh, maybe in future we'll figure this out. But uh, the question was, have you seen, uh, we, we've talked about you know, the resources, are our students engaging? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question here, uh, whether you think the uh, being virtual and COVID uh, has affected the actual number of student-led startups. So I know, although they might not be engaging as much in the classes, do we have any, any evidence to support whether or not the students are starting more or less uh, ventures during this time? Um, I guess I, typical professor, I have, <laughs> I have two answers here. <laughs> uh, one is that uh, for, from my perspective at Indiana, we're seeing a lot of students uh, coming to me, you know, via Zoom or phone calls, asking about ideas they've come up with um, to help the COVID situation. So they're all kind of think about their environment, what's going on and you know, how can they help? I have seen that, uh, but here's the problem we have run into, and maybe a lot of you have too at your, your centers, your universities. Um, we've got an accelerator uh, on our campus here that uh, I work closely with. It's actually located in our school of informatics, uh, computing and engineering. Uh, but the donor of that entire center is, is my donor. So obviously we're 
we're partnered with them. Uh, and it's a fabulous modern space, like a lot of you probably have uh, with your incubation facilities. But right now it's shut down. No one's allowed in the building. <laughs> and so, so the students can't come in. And so one would say, well, why does that make a difference? Well, again, we're back to this social engagement part. They're not engaging with anybody, not their fellow students, not the, the, the person who's head of the, 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 um, you know, the center there. Um, it, it's just hard. It's, it's just, and so I think, again, I think what's happening is when, when we were asking, talking about student engagement, <clears throat> the students are, they're just kind of numb right now. I don't think they know exactly what they want to do. And so, again, I don't have a, a lot of evidence. I, like I, I did some survey around the country, but just, just from what's happening here in Indiana, and we're quite a large university, um, but you know, and maybe a lot of you are experiencing the same thing. Will it come back? Yes, I do believe that. I, I, students are resilient. They will bounce back and, and they will continue to have ideas and go beyond COVID and, and stuff like that. So I have a lot of faith in students. I really do. I, I, like I said, I think they're resilient. I think once we can get them back in more full time, um, I, then I do believe we're gonna see a surge of ideas. I really do. I, I, I think it's gonna be really good times for our centers and for us to try to help these students see entrepreneurship as a career choice. I really do. And is that, do you- and I, oh, sir. I would like to sorry, add a uh, quick comment. So I, I'm Richard Chen, I'm from Stony Brook University. And uh, we actually, so we were looking at the entrepreneurial real activities on the crowdfunding space. When we actually noticed an increasing number of uh, crowdfunding campaign launch on the uh, uh, on those kickstarters, uh, which look at the period between uh, March to October this year, and compared with previous year, you know, the activity actually jumped is one point three six percent higher than the previous year. So I think the entrepreneurial activity is certainly uh, picking up in elsewhere, which could be interesting. Yeah, that's great. Explore. That's great to know. Thank you. I mean, that's a, there you go. That's actually, you know, uh, some research that's been done to show that. So, yeah, and I think it's going to pick up faster when we all start to come back. I really do. Um, I really believe that. And is that, do you think that's because, you know, sort of a backlog of, of ideas and, and energy, or is that because we're going to have that many more opportunities after, after so many? Well, I think two things, Ben, you, you, you've hit on two points. One is I think there'll be a backlog of energy and, and students that have ideas. And second, as you know, all of you know this, every real disruption we've had in our economies, whether it was the 08 or the, the for those that are old enough, the tech wreck, <laughs> and go, for those you can go back with me in time, um, it's always been sort of the innovative entrepreneurial mindset that has brought us out of it every single time. And I think students realize that. And so I think that with that pent up energy and emotions and all that, and they come in, they're gonna wanna take, take us in the new directions. And so I, I think it's going to be a combination of those two things, Ben. Thank you. And just to, to the group, I, I'm trying. I'm, I, I, there's a bunch of uh, there's a bunch of great questions coming in through the chat. I'm trying to um, skip over ones where I think we've already touched on it and trying to start combining some of these questions. But if if you post a question and it didn't get answered, feel free to, to repost if you if you're really passionate about it. Um, but there's a great question here that I think we need to get to um, about fundraising and philanthropy. After COVID, do you think fundraising and philanthropy is going to get better or worse for centers um, and, and entrepreneurship in general moving forward? And someone else, I'm going to attack someone else's question on here. They brought up the question of corporate partnerships and whether, whether you think that is a, a good solution. All right. So first thing is, I think when we first get out of this COVID thing, um, yeah, I think it's going to be a little bit tougher landscape to raise money from donors um, <clears throat> because I think that right now uh, they're getting pulled in a lot of directions. Uh, we just had what Giving Tuesday. We've got, I mean, the the, the not for profits are just swarming us. I, I turned on the news this morning, our local news out of Indianapolis, and it was Pack the Pantries Day. We gotta we gotta save the pantries. They gotta they they want to give out I don't know how many million meals to people, which I understand. And so they want money and they want, so I just think it's gonna be, I think they're all gonna be a bit inundated for a while here. And so I think that the, the way I would phrase it is, 
Do I still think you can raise money philanthropically? Yes, but you better have a really good storyline and you better have a really good pitch in what you're gonna do with that money and how it's gonna be uh, effectively used. Uh, almost like we tell our entrepreneur students, right? Better be an effective pitch, better show how it's all gonna be utilized. I think we're gonna live that ourselves. I, I really believe that. And, and what do you think about the- oh, Yeah, the corporate partnerships, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to skip that. Uh, I think it's a brilliant idea because I really think that um, in my past and everything, I have built corporate partnerships and, and re received money from them and stuff. So I think there's ways to do that and ask them to sponsor competitions or sponsor this or whatever, or be a partner to the center and stuff. I think that's a great way to go. I really do. Um, and so that's, that's a good strategy. I, I would just say that. Um, we've got another question here. So, so kind of dealing with where entrepreneurship centers lie and some of the trends we've seen in creating, you know, standalone schools of entrepreneurship and standalone centers that don't fall within a, a, a school. What are your, what are your thoughts on, on where those trends are, are going and, and the pros and cons? Uh, well, I got a lot of thoughts. I think that, uh, I think entrepreneurship is, is growing in importance, not only in business schools, but across our campuses. And all of you, I know of probably experienced that. Uh, and we're very active on our campus, all through the campus with our different schools and stuff. And I'm sure many of you are as well. Um, so entrepreneurship is growing because uh, my belief for those that know me is that uh, it's become a mindset. Entrepreneurship is, is not just about starting a business anymore. That's part of it. I mean, that's that's one aspect, but there's there's corporate entrepreneurship, there's social entrepreneurship. It's a mindset. It's, it's something in everything we do we are academic entrepreneurs. Why? Because we have an entrepreneurial mindset. And so I think that's why it's become more and more powerful over the years that I've witnessed. And that's not going to go away. That's going to be huge. And so I think that's going to continue to grow. Now, whether, whether I believe we should be schools of entrepreneurship or uh, we're a department of management and entrepreneurship. And I've been asked many times, why don't you become a department of entrepreneurship? There's pros and cons, folks. <laughs> Same with the school. Uh, there's pros and cons to all that. And so uh, we don't have time to get into it today. But um, again, I would always caution a school to be strategic in why they're doing that and why they're developing that. Uh, because again, remember, we're going to be facing some budgetary times ahead. And so you don't want to be an island. That's not good. Um, so Again, just be strategic. But uh, I think when this all passes and we, the growth of entrepreneurship is, is going to be more and more important, uh, you know, then we'll get back, I think, to talking more about uh, departments and schools and all that, you know, how we're gonna uh, sort of position ourselves in the future. Well, Dr. K, thank you so much. This, is, this has been such a brief conversation, but obviously a, a tremendously valuable one. Um, as I said earlier, we're hoping to, to, to continue this conversation um, into the, um, our annual meeting at the, um, at the conference. So I hope you will join us there. Um, Dr. K, if you are available, we'd love for you to, to join us for that. Um, sure. and, um, and we will um, invite, um, invite many others to, to that conversation and, and keep this going because I think uh, as so many of you had some, some excellent questions, I think there's a lot there's a lot of unknowns coming up, and, and Dr. K, as you said it, no one can can sort of uh, know exactly what the fortune, uh, what the future is going to be. No one's a fortune teller, um, so we're we're going to have to remain um, innovative, innovative, and, and entrepreneurial as we go through this, um, and um, and hopefully uh, the USASB conference and and all of our colleagues here can be a part of that. Um, so, um, Dr. K, thank you again. Hopefully, you can um, stick around if we've got time at the end. I know we kind of want to do uh, more of an open um, Q and A session with everybody. Um, so, um, but, but Dr. K, thank you again. I well, one last thing I would say, Ben, to everyone is, um, you know, you're all great leaders, and I, I've always believed this that all of our centers differ in a lot of ways. We differ in our missions we, because our, our universities are are all uniquely different and stuff. So, um, but I think there's still things like we're doing today, trying to share thoughts uh, and ideas with each other. Uh, because that's the value of USASB. It's coming together and, and sharing our thoughts and ideas because we all learn from each other. I, I still learn from all of you. 
Uh, and so, you know, let's 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 keep the conversation going because it's going to help all of us.